going to ask you to turn in God's precious word to Psalm number 5. And we're going to conclude our study in this chapter of God's word today, Psalm number 5. And let's read it through and then come to the time of prayer. Psalm number five and verse number one. Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my meditation. Hearken unto the voice of my cry, my King and my God. For unto thee will I pray. My voice shalt thou hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning will I direct my prayer unto thee and will look up. For thou art not a God that hath pleasure in wickedness, neither shall evil dwell with thee. The foolish shall not stand in thy sight, thou hearest all workers of iniquity. Thou shalt destroy them that speak leasing. The Lord will abhor the bloody and deceitful man. But as for me, I will come into thy house in the multitude of thy mercy. And in thy fear will I worship toward thy holy temple. Lead me, O Lord, in thy righteousness because of mine enemies. Make thy way straight before my face. For there is no faithfulness in their mouth. Their inward part is very wickedness. Their throat is an open sepulchre. They flatter with their tongue. Destroy thou them, O God. Let them fall by their own counsels. Cast them out in the multitude of their transgressions. For they have rebelled against thee. Let all those that put their trust in thee rejoice. Let them ever shout for joy, because thou defendest them. Let them also that love thy name be joyful in thee, for thou, Lord, wilt bless the righteous. With favour wilt thou compass him as with a shield. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for the privilege of meeting around the open word today. We thank Thee, Lord, for this book. We thank You, O Lord, for the truth that it contains. Praise You, O Lord, for the many times that Thou hast spoken to us through Thy word. And Lord, we pray that today Thou wilt shine the spotlight of understanding upon the sacred page. We ask, O Lord, that we will know Thy truth. We ask that we will obey Thy truth. Lord, thou knowest the need of each individual in this congregation this morning. Lord, thou knowest our hearts. Thou knowest the words that we need to hear. And I pray, O Lord, that thou wilt minister individually and personally and pointedly to our hearts this morning. May we know the voice of the Lord saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. O Lord, we thank thee. We thank thee and praise thee from the depths of our heart for the fullness of thy salvation. We thank thee for every provision that's been made through the cross work of Calvary. We thank thee for every promise that has been given to us in the book. We thank thee, Lord, for every assurance that thou hast blessed us with. And Lord, Lord, this morning we pray that as we meet around thy word, that once again we will glean much. We pray, Heavenly Father, that we will be strengthened in our inner man this morning through the proclamation of thy word. I pray that thou wilt empty me of self and sin. Fill me with thy Holy Spirit. Help me not to err, but help me to rightly divide the word of truth. Help me to be faithful to the book and to Christ. And I pray, Lord, that above all things, the Lord himself will minister to us through his precious word. O Lord, we thank thee that whenever we come seeking the favor of God, we never leave disappointed. We thank you, Lord, that thou art not a disappointment, but, O Lord, thou art our joy, thou art our strength, thou art our salvation. Help us this morning, O Lord, to hear thy voice, for we ask in our Saviour's precious name. Amen. Amen. Well, over the past two studies in this chapter of God's Word, we've been very much reminded that the child of God is not immune from difficulties in life. They're not immune from trials or troubles. In fact, the hymn writer summed it up very well when he said, it's not an easy road we're traveling to heaven. For many are the thorns on the way. But then he reminds us why we can keep pressing on. It's not an easy road, but the Savior is with us. 
His presence gives us joy every day. You see, friend, that's what makes a difference in the Christian life. Knowing the presence of God. Looking to the Savior. Because even in the most difficult circumstances of life, there is joy available for the child of God. In a congregation such as this, there are many faces, and of course our backgrounds differ. Perhaps this year for you has been a difficult year. Perhaps you can honestly say that this has been a hard year for you. The tears have fallen. The difficulties have been very real and they've been very bitter. Perhaps for you it's been the past number of months. Perhaps for you it's been the past week or a few days where you have faced difficulty. If you were in control of the events of your life, you wouldn't have chosen the circumstances that you're found in today. And as we come to Psalm number 5, we've been thinking about what does a child of God do in difficulties? What does he do when he faces difficult circumstances, trials, tribulations, hardships, times whenever the going is tough? What does the child of God do? What ought they to do? Well, the first thing that we considered was that they ought to pray. And they said there in verse number one, Give ear to my word, O Lord. Consider my meditation. Hearken on to the voice of my cry, my King and my God. For unto thee will I pray. And here we have a man who's in difficulty, a man who is very real enemies. And the first thing that he does is he comes to the Lord in prayer. And then the second thing that he does is he seeks to follow the Lord. He seeks to be obedient to the Lord. Verse number eight, lead me, O Lord, in thy righteousness because of mine enemies. Make thy way straight before my face. And not only does he pray, but he sets his heart toward God. He sets his heart aright and he says, I am resolved to honor and obey the Lord. The third thing that he does in the time of difficulty is he rejoices. He rejoices. It says, verse number 11, but let all those that put their trust in thee rejoice. Let them ever shout for joy. Because thou defendest them, let them also that love thy name be joyful in thee. For thy Lord wilt bless the righteous. With favor wilt thou compass him as with a shield. He rejoices. He prays. He obeys. And he rejoices. Now, humanly speaking, we can understand in some measure the command to pray even in trouble. Yes, we need to pray in trouble. We can, humanly speaking, understand the command to be obedient, even in difficulties. Yes, we have to be obedient to the Lord at all times. But this is a difficult one for many to understand. Child of God, rejoice, even in the day of difficulty. Rejoice. But you don't know what I'm going through. You don't know the difficulties in my life. You don't know the hardships I have to face. You don't know the tears that fall from my eyes because of the difficulties of life. And yet, God's wisdom isn't as man's wisdom. You see, man's wisdom is when things are going okay, then you can be happy. Then you can rejoice. But oh, the wonder of God's salvation, because it doesn't matter about your circumstances. You always can rejoice as a believer, because you have much to rejoice in, and we're going to look at that in a few moments this morning. Let's look at some of the passages in God's word where this command is given. If you turn with me to Matthew's gospel chapter 5, there is a command to rejoice. In Matthew's gospel chapter 5 and verse number 11, we read these words. Matthew's gospel chapter 5 verse number 11, we're at the Mount of Beatitudes, and it says, blessed are ye, and that word means happy or joyful are ye. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. And you see, it says here, perhaps believer, you're being persecuted, even though you're in the right. Perhaps this morning you're seeking to serve the Lord and your motives are being questioned. Perhaps someone's put a question mark over your life, another believer. 
Perhaps someone has said something against you that's wrong. Perhaps someone has done something that is false against you. That's a very difficult thing to do. That's a very hard thing to face. Whenever somebody says something about you and you know what's false, and you know what's not true, and that hurts, and especially when it's from another Christian, that's what hurts the most when a brother or sister in Christ says something against you that's absolutely no foundation. That's a very difficult thing. And you might think, well, what should I do? Well, I should just shut myself away and lick my wounds and feel sorry for myself. The Lord Jesus Christ here says, rejoice. Rejoice. Now, not because of what has happened, not because of the circumstances, not because of the better words, but rather because it's an evidence of your salvation. Because the holy men of God that came before you, they spoke against them too. And they're speaking against you. You see, the devil sees you as such a threat that people are speaking against you. He says, rejoice and be exceeding glad. Why? Great is your reward in heaven. Oh, it's difficult here and now. You have to go through the tribulations. Great is your reward in heaven. And when you get to heaven, whenever we come to the time of judgment, God will set aright every wrong. And friends, you might have been accused of something that you're innocent of. And perhaps someone has bad-mouthed you and said something that's been awful against you. God will put it right. God will vindicate his people. And God will put aright every wrong that has been said and every wrong that has been spoken. We read this morning in Philippians 4, verse number 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. It doesn't say rejoice in the Lord whenever things are going your way. No, it says rejoice in the Lord always. But you know what the secret is? The secret is in that little phrase, in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. You see, he is a constant stay. No matter how difficult our circumstances may be, no matter how much they change, we can rejoice in the Lord always. And he re-emphasizes, and again I say rejoice. Whether the day is an easy day or a difficult day, rejoice. Whether it's a clear day or a cloudy day, a happy day or a sad day, a peaceful day or a perilous day, God's people can rejoice in the Lord. You know, in Romans chapter 14 and verse number 17, it says, The kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. And being saved, having spiritual life, means that we are receiving those blessings that Christ has purchased for us. And of course, righteousness is one of those things. The robe of righteousness is ours. The peace of God is ours. But it says, the kingdom of God is righteousness and peace and joy. And this morning, no matter what your circumstances, joy is something that God has purchased for his people. Now, friend, I am not belittling your circumstances. And I'm not saying that it's not, that it's not hard, and I'm not saying that we don't have to face difficult times. What I am saying, when you do face those difficult times, and when you do face those hardships, if your eyes are upon the Lord, then you can know joy. You can know joy within the verses I want us to look at this morning are verses 11 and 12. But let all those that put their trust in thee rejoice. Let them ever shout for joy because thou defendest them. Let them also that love thy name be joyful in thee. And the first thing I want you to notice this morning is this, that the joyful heart comes as a result of taking the first two steps. The joyful heart comes as a result of taking the first two steps. You see, the first step is prayer, and the second step is obedience. Oh yes, we want joy, of course we do. We want to know assurance. We want to know what it is to rejoice in the God of our salvation. But it doesn't start with joy. It starts with two other things. It starts, first of all, with prayer and obedience. In other words, it starts with a right relationship with God. Now, if you're saved and you're not a person of prayer and you're not obedient to the things God has revealed unto you, well, then you will not know the fullness of joy. You'll not be able to rejoice 
Because that is a special gift for those who have obeyed God, for those who are going through with God. And this man has a great problem. And what steps does he take? You see, at the start of this psalm, he's surrounded by his enemies. He's so concerned by his enemies, by his troubles, that he gets on his knees and he falls before the Lord. Then he resolves to be obedient. And by the end of the psalm, he's rejoicing. What's taking place in between? He's prayed to the Lord and he's been obedient to the Lord. You see, we all desire joy. And the pathway in God's word is very simple. It's prayer and obedience. Obedience to the Lord. Him writers say, I trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Trust and obey. And you know, God's spiritual blessings are often those that are promised as a result of obedience. God's spiritual blessings are often promised as a result of obedience. For example, in first or Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, it says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. And there's not one this morning, but you'll say, oh, that the Lord would hear from heaven. Oh, that the Lord would forgive our sin, that the Lord will heal our land, that the Lord will restore the church of Jesus Christ again, that it might be set on fire for him. But there's a word there that's very important that people forget about at the start of that verse. It says, if, if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn away from their disobedience or their wicked ways and are obedient to me, then I will, I will, I will pour out my blessing. You see, the same thing happened in the church in Acts, in Acts chapter 2, and you can read it when you go home, 42 to 47. We read at the end of that chapter, they're praising God, they've great spiritual influence in the land that The people are being added on to the church such as should be saved. But that's not how it started. It started with them fellowshipping together, obeying the doctrines that the apostles were teaching, having all things in common. You see, they were obedient to the word of God. They were a people of prayer. They were a people of obedience. And what happened? The Lord poured out his blessing. The Lord poured out his blessing. And therefore, this morning, the desire of God in his word is that whenever you come to difficulties and when you come to trials and when you come to temptations and when you come to troubles, that you come to the Lord in prayer and with a resolution that I will obey. There's a beautiful course that says, Father, I place into your hands the things that I can't do. Father, I place into your hands the times that I've been through. Father, I place into your hands the way that I should go, for I know I always can trust you. Father, I place into your hands my friends and family. Father, I place into your hands the things that trouble me. Father, I place into your hands the person I would be, for I know I always can trust you. Father, we love to seek your face. We love to hear your voice. Father, we love to sing your praise and in your name rejoice. Father, we love to walk with you and in your presence rest, for we know we always can trust you. The first thing I want you to notice there is the joyful heart comes as a result of following the first two steps. But the second thing is this. The joyful heart comes in spite of the difficulties. In spite of the difficulties. Look at verses 9 and 10. It speaks about the enemies and it says there is no faithfulness in their mouth. Their inward part is very wickedness. Their throat is an open sepulcher. They flatter with their tongue. Destroy thou them, O God. Let them fall by their own counsels. Cast them out in the multitude of their transgressions. For they have rebelled against thee. David's enemies hadn't gone away. David's enemies at this stage hadn't been weakened. But David did the greatest thing that any person can do with an enemy. He left them in the hand of God. Lord, thou shalt deal with them. And he's reminded that the Lord will deal with every enemy of the child of God. All of God's enemies 
And all those who are against the children of God are against God himself, and God will deal with them. And even in the midst of difficulties, he still finds joy because he knows God's in control. God is in control. You know, there are even times in Scripture where God's people thank the Lord for their difficulties. They thank the Lord for their troubles. I know of testimonies where people have thanked the Lord for placing them in the sickbed to show them the delicacy of life, how fickle life is. And then they came to the Lord. I know there's people even through the passing of a loved one, a close friend, through that difficult and dark trial, have been spoken to by the Lord and have been brought to salvation, even through those circumstances. You see, we must remember as a child of God that God does order our circumstances. And everything he allows in our life, he permits for a reason. For his glory and for our good. I remember reading the testimony of Corrie ten Boom. Corrie ten Boom was a Dutch lady and during the Second World War in her home she hid uh, the Jews. And she had about 10 or 12 Jews hid in a sacred place in her home. Whenever she was found out, the Germans took her and her family and they put them into concentration camps. Now Corrie ten Boom was a Christian. Before, she, before the war broke out, she held children's meetings, she held youth fellowships and she saw many boys and girls one for the Lord. Here's a lady seeking to keep God's people, the Jews in safety and yet it seems to be that she's being punished and she went into the concentration camp and she lay in the bed and her sister Betsy lay in the bed beside her and she wasn't lying in the bed too long until the bed bugs started to bite her and she felt the little insects running against her body and all over the bed and her sister turned to Corrie ten Boom and she says, Corrie Let's thank the Lord. Let's thank the Lord that we're together here. Let's thank the Lord that we haven't been separated. At least we have each other. Let's thank the Lord that we got the scriptures and with God's word here. And Corrie wasn't feeling too much like thanking the Lord in these circumstances. Her freedom had been taken away. She'd been stripped and had to stand naked with all the other people. She'd been beaten by the Germans, starved and traveled in a cattle trailer for three days without any food or water. She didn't feel like thanking the Lord. And she turned to her sister and says, goodness, you're going to have me thanking the Lord for even these bed bugs next. And her sister said, yes, let's thank the Lord for everything. And her sister that evening prayed, Lord, thank you for everything. Thank you for your goodness to us, Lord. Thank you that we're here. Lord, use us when we're here. We even thank you for the bed bugs in this place, Lord, for we know that nothing happens outside of your plan and outside of your purpose. Lord worked in Corey's heart and she came back to the Lord she held meetings in the barracks in which she was stationed and she led many ladies to saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Many days, some hours before they went into God's eternity as they died, she preached the gospel. Many years later, whenever she was rescued from that concentration camp, she went around the world giving her testimony. She told those stories about how the Lord had dealt with her heart, about her bitterness over being in the barracks, about the bedbugs. One night, after one of the meetings, a man came up to her and shook her hand. He was one of the German soldiers in that concentration camp. And he said, do you know the reason you were able to preach the gospel? Do you know the reason we never checked out to see what was going on in that particular barrack and those particular dorm rooms? He says, it was infested with insects and with lice. He said, we didn't want to get infested. And because they were in that particular barrack, the Lord kept the German soldiers away. And Corrie was able to open their Bible every night and won souls for the Savior. You see, even the lice, even the bed bugs, even those things were in the purpose and the plan of God. And she never thought I'd say it. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the little insects that bit me every night. Because through that, I was able to lead souls to the Savior. See, friend, if we understand this thing, God brings us to everything that happens in our lives. Now, there are things and difficulties in our lives that come about as our disobedience, as a result of our disobedience. But friend, when you're walking with the Lord and difficulties and trials come into your life, we can trust that our Father knows best. 
He knoweth the way that I take. He knoweth the way that I take. Paul had to go through prison. Paul had to have the thorn in the flesh. Paul had to be shipwrecked. Paul had to be beat. And yet he was able to say in Philippians 4, 4, Rejoice in the Lord. Always and again I say rejoice. Daniel had to go through the den of lions. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego had to go through the fire. But the wonderful truth is this. God just doesn't bring us to the trouble. He brings us through the trouble. Brings us right on through. Not just to the fire, but through the fire. And his grace is sufficient. Not only does joy come in spite of the difficulties. God doesn't always remove the difficulties. But this joy that we speak of is not some superficial emotional high. It's not giddiness. It's not hyperactivity. It's not a special happiness that someone can say something to you and two seconds later you're down in the dumps. That's not the joy of the Lord. That's a happiness depending upon circumstances. This is an inner joy, a peace, a contentment that is based upon knowledge. It's based upon the word of God. You see, there are some people, and they'll say, and maybe you said it, well, I don't feel like a Christian. I don't feel saved today. And perhaps the devil even has came to you and said, oh, well, look at the difficulties in your life. Are you really saved? And you start to think, am I? Look at the difficulties in my life. Friend, it's times like this you have to base your faith and your certainty and your joy upon the word of God. This is the source of your joy, not your circumstances, because they wax and wane, they change. But you come to the word of God, and you read the words, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Lord, I remember the night I called, and here's your promise, I shall be saved. I'm a Christian. No man shall pluck me out of the Father's hand. Lord, I'm in difficult circumstances now, but I know I can't lose my salvation. It's coming upon the word of God. I will never leave thee. I will never forsake thee. Lord, this is your promise. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And this inner joy is based upon the knowledge of God. It's the knowledge of who you are in Christ. And not only that, the knowledge of who Christ is. Knowledge of our Savior. That's where your joy comes from. Knowing who Christ is. He's the unchanging one. He's the eternal one. He is the holy one. He's the just one. He's the good one. And here we come to verse number 11. And I want you to notice some of the words that the psalmist used to describe his joy. He says, verse number 11, but let all those that put their trust in thee rejoice. And that literally means be glad. Be glad. Let all those that put their trust in thee rejoice or be glad. Friend, why can we be glad in difficulties? Because our God doesn't change. He's in control of our circumstances. Then it says there, let them ever shout for joy. And that little phrase, shout for joy, literally means to cry out or to sing. To sing. To praise the Lord. To triumph. And that's the mark of a believer. That he's able to sing unto the Lord. You see, in the world, whenever they're happy, they sing happy songs. Whenever they're sad, they sing sad songs. For the child of God, when they want to sing, they sing Christ. They sing the Savior. They sing about the blood. They sing about heaven. They sing about grace. They sing about mercy. They sing about victory. Because these are always their reality. These are the themes of our song. We sang this morning about the haven of rest. We sang this morning about when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. And these things thrill us, even though things are difficult. You know what it is to stand in the midst of God's people and lend your voice and worship the Lord and the truths of these hymns thrill your soul. Why? Because they're about the Lord and his work. And then it says um, also in the verse number 11, let them also that love thy name be joyful in thee. And that means to jump for joy. That's what that literally means. Jump for joy. I'm excited. I'm rejoicing because of my Savior. What he's done for me and what he will do for me. But not only are we given the type of joy we ought to have, notice the reasons that are given for the joy. You see, it's not because things will work out my way, not because the troubles will be removed, but rather, verse number 11 says, 
because thou defendest them. That's why we ought to rejoice this morning. No matter what you're going through, the Lord defends you. He covers you over. He protects you. He fences you in. That's the word. He covers you. That word was used in Exodus chapter 33 whenever Moses said unto the Lord, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And the Lord said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock, and it shall come to pass that while my glory passeth by, I will put thee in the cleft of the rock, and will cover thee with my hand while I pass by. And will take away mine hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. And that little phrase, I will cover thee with my hand while I pass by, that's the same word that it says here. He will defend us. He defends his people. And that defense was a defense that protected him from death. And therefore, the defense that's around the child of God this morning is a defense upon your very life. God defends his people. You know, there are those who are used of the Lord. And the devil has them marked out. And the devil, if he had his way, would have them in the grave. Because they're holy. Because they're faithful. Because they're making a mark on their society. And on their family. And on their school. And they're all and out for the Lord. And the devil would love to have them killed. Just like he wanted to have Peter. But God defends him. And you will never leave this scene of time one second before the Lord has ordained it. And that wonderful thing, no matter who comes against you, no matter, what, no matter what Satan throws at you, no matter what even sickness you go through, you'll not leave this scene of time until the Lord calls you home. Oh, the protection that the Lord gives. But not only that, it says there, in verse number 12, not only will he defend them, but for thy, O Lord, will bless the righteous. And that word bless is a word that means he will benefit them abundantly and he will continue to benefit them. It's a continual word. He will continue to benefit and bless his people. Now, who are the righteous? The righteous are the just. In fact, that word means for those who have been made just. Isn't that wonderful? We're sinners but we've been saved by grace. We've made just in the sight of a holy God and the Lord himself has cleansed us and the Lord will continue to bless us. How does the Lord bless us? Well, he cares for us. Casting all your care upon him for he careth for you. This world does not care for the soul of the believer, but thank God he cares. And friend, if it's a concern to you this morning, then it's a concern to the Lord. And the Lord desires to carry your burdens. His compassion, we can praise him because he blesses us with compassion. That everlasting love, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. We can praise him for his covenant because he has made a promise with himself that he has redeemed us, that he will bring us safe to heaven, that we will never be left out of his promises because he cannot lie. We can praise him for his control, for his sovereignty. We can praise him for his companionship. I will never leave thee. I will never forsake thee. You see, friends may forsake you. Your family may even forsake you. But I will never leave thee. He'll never leave thee even in the hospital bed. He'll never leave thee even whenever you hear the bad news. He'll never leave thee whenever you can't see what step to take ahead. Christ is there. He's there holding thy hand saying, fear not. I will help thee. He is there. And then we also read another reason why we ought to praise him because verse number 12 says, with favor wilt thou compass him as with a shield. And that word favor means delight. Friend, God delights to bless his children. He delights to protect his children. And you know, the very first mention of the word shield in scripture comes whenever the Lord spoke unto Abraham and he said, fear not, Abraham, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Do you know what the final mention of shield in scripture is this? Ephesians 6, 16. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. How do we fight against Christ? How do we fight against Satan? We put on Christ. We stand behind the shield of Christ. And praise God, he's able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked.
Final thought this morning is this. This joy, even in the midst of difficulties, even in the midst of hardships and trials, friend, it's an experience that only the believer can know. Only the child of God can know this joy. Because it says, let all those that put their trust in thee rejoice. That word trust is a beautiful word. In fact, those that put their trust is just one word in the Hebrew. And it means this, to flee to someone for protection, to confide in. And that's exactly what a Christian is. Someone who has fled to Christ for protection. Someone who has confided in Christ for refuge and whose confidence is Christ. Let me ask you a question. Are you saved this morning? Let me ask you a question. Have you fled to Christ for protection? Friend, how will you stand on the day of judgment when the wrath of God is poured out upon a wicked world? When the books are open and the sin of mankind is brought before you, I'll tell you why I'll stand. Because I fled to Christ for protection. He is defending me. He is protecting me. He is surrounding me. And I am complete in him. That's my only hope. That's my only plea. I'm confiding. I am hoping. I have confidence in Christ. What about you this morning? Friend, if you're not saved, friend, you've nothing to rejoice in. If you're not saved this morning, friend, you've nothing to praise about. But thank God, if you're saved, there's a song that the world cannot take away. Not any circumstance, not any difficulty, not any trial. And with the words of Habakkuk we finish, although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines, the labor of the olive shall fail and the field shall yield no meat, the flocks shall be cut off from the fold, there shall be no herd in the stalls. Yet will I rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord is my strength. And friend, what I would say to you when difficulties come, not if, but when difficulties come, you have two choices. You can look at the difficulties or you look to Christ. Look to Christ this morning. Look to Christ. I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. Amen. Let's pray. Our gracious Lord and our loving, eternal heavenly Father, we thank thee and praise thee. The Lord, the joy that thou hast purchased for us upon the cross is a joy that the world cannot give us, but we thank thee, Lord, it's a joy the world cannot take away. And I pray this morning for each child of God in this gathering. Oh Lord, I pray that thou will help us to be men and women of prayer, men and women of obedience, and men and women of joy. O oh Lord, we may this week in thy will face difficult times, sickness, trials, disappointments, even death. But we thank thee, O oh Lord, that when we're looking to Christ, none can rob us of the joy. O oh Lord, we thank thee while their circumstances change, that thou dost remain the same. Lord, there's not even a shadow of turning with thee. And we thank thee we can rest safe and secure in the God of our salvation. Lord, help us to live faithfully before thee. Those not saved this morning, I pray, Lord, that thou wilt cause them to come to Christ, cause them to flee for protection to the rock of ages, cause them, O Lord, to know what it is to be saved and sure of salvation. We pray you'll bless us this day, bless those who'll meet around the Lord's table. Help us to have a time of fellowship and joy in the presence of God. For we ask in our Saviour's name. Amen.